Yeah, good morning and thank you for this opportunity. It's the, since everyone seems to be talking about the future of work, I, and uh, I'm a, a lurker at heart in, in many ways. I now spent the last four or five years before retirement thinking a lot about why community participation worked the way it did and why work didn't feel like that. And uh, I just want to spend the next 25 minutes sharing, you know, what thoughts I have about it. And I'm sort of very happy to take questions after that. When I, when I, and I grew up as a child of the 60s, born in 57. Things took a little time to come to India, but, uh, uh, I, you know, my, my summer of love was closer to 69 than 67. There's a time delay for these things to sort of rattle their way through and get known. And I also had to grow old enough. So, you know, 12 or 13 was probably the minimum before I could engage without my parents getting too upset. But part of growing up at that time and the experience since, you know, and I've spent like 40 years as a result in something that vaguely passed for tech, uh, was a real sense of utopia about tech. You know, that we could solve the world because of technology. It was going to sort of solve Middle East peace, world hunger, <laughs> get our, you know, medical lives together. I wasn't into the we would live forever. I had, you know, no part of me was into that necessarily. But I genuinely believe that technology would serve us uh, to keep us happier, better, it would reduce inequality. It would deal with the kind of issues I was growing up with as a child. And I had a grandfather who would say things to me. He was a chemistry professor. And he'd say things to me like, uh, your peak longevity generation. And uh, that's like a bit of a shock thing. You know, what do you mean? That my children are going to live less long than I am. And then he'd sit and explain why he thought so. And this was like, in the early 70s, or you need to be rich to be thin. And statements, you know, every one of those statements made me wonder what life uh, sort of had for us going forward. And uh, then, you know, I look at today and there is a sense of what have we wrought? Because in many ways, Technology is a participant, sometimes a catalyst, sometimes an enabler, but we can't leave it out of having increased inequality, having interfered with our sort of political and economic systems. Uh, not everything that has come out of technology has necessarily uh, been something I can stand up today and say, wow, that was great. Not that it hasn't, you know, I'm, I'm still a, tech, a, a utopian in that sense. But I've had to temper it with saying, not everything has worked. We have to have feedback loops. We've got to get better. And I remember talking with Freeman Dyson uh, in, a, in a, like he was in a, you know, the lobby of a conference I was attending because his daughter was organizing the conference. And, uh, you know, he would say things like, in the 40s, we were planning to use nuclear power to, for space travel. And it took us a little while to figure out maybe that wouldn't work. Okay? So those sort of, sort of implications, it's perfectly reasonable from a scientific viewpoint to say you have a model, you try to refine it, you put it to use, you learn something about it, you refine it again, there's an iteration. So I'm still of that belief that you know, iteration is what's going to help get to this utopia. Okay, uh, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm still young enough to 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 believe in the Jetsons. Sort of, you know, I I, I do want to be able to to fly on my own. Right, uh, to figure out the global warming or climate change costs somewhere along the line. But I'd, I'd like to be able to impart that kind of. Uh, that uh, sense of optimism, it can be pragmatic, it can have the necessary 
you know, down to earth, how do I actually make this work? But the alternative is of no interest to me. I, you know, I can't be chicken little kind of fear. And that was, I, as, as a result of that, I tried to, to look at what was happening in society. And in many ways, uh, things confused me. Okay? Everything I understood from uh, studying how the technology I call technology had sort of roots in the 50s and 60s based on papers and work and investment in the 40s and leading back to, you know, the, the research and thoughts of people maybe 100, 150 years worth. So I'm not sort of in any way discounting that, but by the time I experienced it, uh, it was about a 60s setup as a reaction in society to a set of world wars and a belief that things were going to improve. But there was a lot of community within it. So I started moving from this idea of technology to a sense of community becoming the important driver. So a meeting like this, a festival like this becomes very important to me because even at the small dinner that uh, I, you know, I attended last night because I came here earlier, uh, it was a real sense of community and how every member in the community had something to bring, to, to contribute, to participate. And that started setting my social context that, you know, uh, I, now that I'm retired, I play golf and one of the first rules of golf is a solitary golfer has no standing in a course. Okay. You have no importance if you're alone. It is defined as a social game to begin with. Everybody can pass you. Everyone can tell you, get off, wait, do whatever you want, because you don't have a right. In a similar kind of way, the, you know, it's, it's like working at BT. You know, what use is one telephone? Right? In any form of exchange or communication or network, you know, one is a pretty useless number. <laughs> the, the sense of participation, the sense of community becomes a key part of how things happen. And, uh, you know, as I watch my children grow up and now I'm watching my grandchildren grow up, uh, there's something fascinating about how they fight for an indi individualism and yet it's individualism within a group. All right. So my first child, and she's what, 33 now, nearly 34. And, I remember her looking at me and saying, by myself, meaning real lead me to do this. I thought she was like three, four, or maybe even younger. But while she's doing it, she turned her head to see whether I was watching, right? It wasn't the sense of doing it by herself, which was important, but doing it by herself while being noticed as doing it by herself. So where, you know, the, the, your part of your group identity also had that feedback loop. And now that I've got two grandchildren and I watch them, the same thing is there. There is a joy in being able to do something yourself, but part of that joy is in being able to, to know that someone is watching you do it and that someone matters to you or the opinion of that someone matters to you. You know, we, we are social people. So... As I tried to establish this sense of uh, community within the, you know, the world of technology, I had to look at how society worked. And all the evidence existed that society was a team sport. Life was a team sport. Okay? It's not, you know, I'm a rock or no man is an island or whatever. There was some genuine reason to believe that we were brought up uh, somewhere within our psyche to be team players, you know, that we, that we had a, a consciousness within us that required us to learn how to work with each other. And then, <laughs> because I spent so much time in sort of financial services, it, I had to take time to explain to people the, the essence of society is always some form of mutualization. Right? Uh, if you look at insurance models, you know, what does it basically say? Well, no one person can take the hit of a major event. But if we could spread that cost in order to prepare for it amongst enough people, 
then the few people whom it did hit would be able to afford it. And by definition, everybody else was paying for those few people to be able to afford the hit. Right? That sharing, that mutualization was part of how the market worked. And it's not an insurance marketplace that evolved out of the city of London or something. You know, you go to any community and you see how they deal with uh, events that affect part of the community. You know, your barn burns down, the rest of the village will come along to help you rebuild that barn, feed you, house you, give you support, provided you paid the price of being a member of the community. Okay? You have to be an active member of the community and it's not equally active, it's not a homogeneous society. You had to just participate enough to say you're doing what you can. So that, you know there is a widow's might aspect to it because it's not a subscription fee that everyone has to meet consistently. It's what you can do for it. And we are differently skilled, we are differently able. So it is expected that there's a, a heterogeneity, a variety, a diversity in community and it will work. And a lot of our, you know, until maybe 150, 200 years ago, we used to live and die within 30 miles of where we were born because the cost of migration was high. We couldn't afford it. And we tended to move because there was some natural or economic or political crisis. Movement was enforced. <laughs> Otherwise, migration was only available to the explorer with a patron behind him or her. It wasn't natural to be able to make those sort of moves. And some people, and I I'm, I'm include myself in it, believe that what happened was the diasporas that took place because man could afford to migrate post the Industrial Revolution as it became cheaper and cheaper to be able to move vast distances. It took time for communications to catch up because the cost of communication didn't drop at the same speed or at the same time. So <laughs> that's what created a kind of environment where when I came to the UK in 1980, uh, I was earning after tax about 230 pounds per month. And it cost me 10 pounds to call my mother in Calcutta for a three minute call. Okay. Uh, imagine that and people trying to take a similar slice of their income to make a three minute call. And the net answer was I didn't make calls and I was too lazy to write. And it became a problem until, you know, mothers and hands and ears and twisting and whatever else happened. But over time, I did communicate occasionally. But people don't realize that the cost of communication did not drop anywhere near as quickly. And then when it did, surprise, surprise, you got Friendster, Friends Reunited, Facebook or whatever, because people used the technology and the lowering of cost to be able to rebuild the communities they were used to having, <laughs> okay? But now they were virtual, they were distributed, but the community existed. Looking further at society, where I got to was saying, if mutualization existed, how did the community work from an electronic viewpoint? So there was a bit of, you know, trying to understand people like Durkheim, get a sense of, you know, uh, community from a sociological perspective, move through that to people like Jürgen Habermas, uh, you know, Howard Rheingold, seeing how communities of practice began to evolve in an electronic world, getting further than that and watching, you know, it may be considered pop science, but I enjoyed reading even people like uh, a Stephen Johnson, you know, helping me understand about whether it's slime mold or ants or swarm behaviors, emergence, and how often things that were hard to do as individuals were solved by community. And these communities were sometimes very similarly skilled, but more often than not differently skilled. And, you know, coming from India, I was used to division of labor within society, and yet I hated the caste system. So how was I going to solve that problem? Because Societies seem to, to work around 
this idea that you did have different skills, but people seem to price or value those skills differently. There was a market failure somewhere within it. And then I realized it wasn't the diversity in skill that was the problem, but the ranking of those skills. As soon as you said, you are better than that person because you know a, a cobbler is better than a baker or something like that, rather than you are differently skilled and for society to work, we need that variety, we need those differences. So I began to get comfortable, you know, by the time I was reading people like Amy Jo Kim and how uh, communities practice formed in, in electronic networks and in the digital or virtual world, a lot of it came down to being able to understand diversity and variety within the community, a lack of attempting to rank that so that you still had equal rights within it, and then a sense that not everybody contributed the same way or with the same volume. As the open source movement started getting more engaged and a lot of you work in different parts of open source, you know, even today, uh, in the late 90s, it also became clear, and this is where my interest in lurking became active, to say almost every community I studied about 5% of the people in the community seem to carry the lion's share of the work. Another 15% or so, uh, just as a rule of thumb, this is not uh, precise scientific research, this is anecdotal, but anecdotal over 20 odd years of being interested in the topic. Uh, and about 20, uh, 15, another 15% seem to be active enablers, participants, supporters. And the rest of the sort of the community, the 80%, uh, were noticed almost by their being passive or appearing to be passive. And these were the people that were being referred to you know, as lurkers. And it didn't make sense to me that uh, the way we looked at that community, it's the 5% that mattered or even the 20. And I was trying my best to figure out this other 80%, there has to be value. Uh, there is a reason why the integral community contains all of it and that the lurker is important. And as I sort of started uh, you know, working through that, I got to a point where the, we were beginning to see freemium models start coming through as uh, you know, post.com, business model started emerging saying not everyone will pay so you got the idea that if you could get uh, a, like a super premium group of you know five ten percent of your subscribers paying heavily uh, a, a smaller group uh, above of the larger whole being able to pay something then you could almost create what the economists might consider a free rider to say as a result, 80% of the people got something for free. And people would analyze this and say, well, yeah, that's the whole essence of the freemium model that you could subsidize through getting a small group of people paying access to something for a much larger group. And then people started sort of corrupting that model to say rather than access for a larger group, you're going to redefine the terms of service to say, you know, he or she who doesn't pay will actually get a degraded service. <coughs> and I began to sort of question why that was the case. But I understood something about this 80-15-5 and had an interest in that to say, uh, no, it's not patronage, but it's a variant on that. You know, why can't the people who afford it subsidize it for the others if they're not a uh, a variant on the mutualization principle to say if you can uh, sort of share out some of that capability to to earn to spend to to afford then you're able to reach more people and uh, it is not necessary for you to say uh, you know this is why the Obamacare kind of discussions drove me nuts saying so, guys when you talk about it as a medical insurance the whole essence of insurance is that you pay in order that a disproportionate hit on part of the population can be absorbed. Right? If the only people who paid were the people who could afford it, 
then there is no point in having the insurance because the mutualization model is missing. So I couldn't even get my head around why those sort of debates were getting as active as they were, because I loved the idea of that inclusion. And then that took me back to the work kind of principle where uh, I kept getting irritated when I would go somewhere with my wife and somebody would ask her, what do you do? And, and, and she'd say, you know, I'm a housewife and I, you get professional people in, in many parts sort of eyes glaze over a bit as if the, you know, this person was not contributing or being a mother wasn't right or whatever. And, you know, they, this was my wife's choice. I didn't force her not to work or anything, but she quite enjoyed what she did and she was busy. But the sense that I had an income and she didn't, didn't make sense for me because if she, if it wasn't for the things she was doing, I was going to be unable to work. Uh, if I tried to price what services she offered within the household and what she did, and I had to do it myself, it would be a very big salary uh, that I would have to replace. So I tried to ensure her absence. So I began to question the idea that this lurker or this person without an income had no value. Because it was because we were trying to measure taxable earnings in some form. And I questioned the unit that we were using to be able to, to deal with income. You know, should we not say household? Should we not say group? And I'm not looking for some sort of nuclear man, woman, two children kind of model. It's just what is the earning unit and who the hell decided it was one person? Right? Uh, was that reasonable or is there a collective even in the capacity to earn? Because there are different skills being brought together to create that value and to contribute. And that went back to keeping hitting this idea of because you don't have a visible, economically measurable cash coming in, taxable uh, identity, somehow what you were doing was not to be valued. Then as I was proceeding towards retirement, I got to a point where, how am I doing on time? Seven. Great. Uh, the, as I was proceeding towards retirement, uh, one of the topics that kept streaming up was this idea of AI is going to take everybody's job away. And uh, you know, the, the machine is going to be uh, what replaces all of us. And again, you know, the same utopian also believed that most of the time, if we act even vaguely responsibly, you know, at least have part of the family brain cell switched on for that day. <coughs> and we are masters of technology rather than technology being masters of us. And this idea that we're creating more and more complex technology and we have no idea what it does, sort of vaguely sounds like a responsibility to me. Saying, what do you mean, you know, you're doing things and you have no idea what the outcomes are going to be? That doesn't sound like, uh, you know, even basic common sense. Uh, you can say there are risks and I'm going to watch those risks. I'm going to figure it out. There's going to be feedback loops. There's going to be iteration. There's going to be learning. But the sort of random, I have no idea, you know, I'm going to play with this. And I have no idea what the outcomes are for society. I mean... You know, this is not like the Freeman Dyson thing, where he said, well, we, at that time, we thought nuclear was going to power us there. Then we learned something, and nuclear wasn't going to power us there. So it's perfectly reasonable to take steps as a result of the feedback loop. But I got to a point where I said, you know, I, I want to be able to use technology to solve for this job loss risk. And initially, I said, well, Somehow it's got to be like UBI. Right? There's got to be a way of having everyone paid by the creation of enough value in society through the application of technology so that we can reduce the income inequality. As a result, we can give people security. And if you gave people enough money, the tendency would be like the patronage in the Middle Ages, but not through fiefdoms and lords and patrons, as it were but through some collective work, social work, we could create funds that were 
able to provide something that was close to UBI. And the model I was looking at, which quite a lot of people are now trying, which fascinates me still, is that if we could make human beings sensors of waste, right, that we, are, we all have access now to smart uh, mobile devices reasonably cheaply almost anywhere in the world, the connected part of the world is growing. Uh, I r read about a, a girl in India who, having spent time in the US, went back to her, the villages that her roots were from, although she hadn't grown up there, and found that life was hell because there was no predictable availability of clean water. And that meant cooking, hygiene, ability to, to dress up for work, plan anything, look after your children. It didn't matter. If you didn't have predictable access to clean water, this was a problem. And she tried to get to why and found out that it was because the infrastructure for delivering water to these villages was so decayed that it kept leaking and the utility company could not afford to do anything other than firefight. Therefore, it was quite random as to when water was available. She spent a little time studying it and came back with the idea of a trade between the villagers and the utility to say the villagers will photograph and report the leak wherever they saw it using their mobile devices and SMS. And in exchange for that service, because it would solve a problem for the utility, the utility would form a schedule that said, uh, you will have water in your village between 11 and 1 or between 2 and 4 or whatever, so that the beginnings of predictability and planning came into it. And this was a simple uh, example for me of human beings becoming sensors of waste and of value being generated from the aggregation of data to do with that waste. And so I started thinking that's what I was going to do. But when I found out there were a lot of people doing it a lot better than me, then my dreams of saying I'm going to do a PhD on UBI to do with AI and sort of and the management of waste was perhaps not for me. But I still couldn't get away with this idea that I was now going to become this lurker, this person without income, this person without value. And uh, there was a guy called, you know, this is one of my big worries. You know, when you remember something and you cannot find any report on the web of what you remember and you wonder whether you made it all up. But I have this distinct memory that I was watching something in the late 80s or early 90s where John Harvey Jones, who used to be the chairman of ICI, was going around looking at companies for a week and then coming back and saying, you know, uh, these are the things you must do to fix it. And whoever ran that series decided that he would look at uh, an erstwhile Maharaja's kingdom. And he went to this kingdom for six days, came back and said, oh, you know, by the way, uh, I've looked at everything. I have good news for you. Uh, you have about, you know, five or 6,000 people were completely redundant, you know, they fulfill no value to the, the kingdom. And this Maharaja looked at him and said, so what will they do? And Harvey Jones said, you don't understand. It's, there is nothing for them to do. And the king looked back and said, but what will they do? And I've grown up with an idea that dignity, a sense of purpose, a sense of inclusion and participation, comes from the mere act of someone feeling that what you're doing is of value. Okay? And we, that's what I'd rather call work rather than connecting it up to an income or a taxable income to say there is a purpose for what you do. And that purpose is something that we have to be able to give everybody. And when I look at community participation and this idea of lurking, and I then went you know, into saying if open source communities work this way, where else? And if you remember the late 80s or early 90s, and I, you know, I look around and say, okay, enough of you would remember, uh, you know, they, working in enterprise, we would get these disks if you belong to a Microsoft Gold Partner program where you had early access to the technology. And what they were doing was open sourcing testing. <laughs> Right? By turning around and saying, we're going to give you a substandard product and 
you can have it early and you can tell us what's wrong with it and we'll make you pay for the privilege. Okay, that's a pretty clever model. <laughs> but the premise of then saying what I saw there, I could see in open source communities as well. Right? Now the lurkers were beginning to light up as having different values. They would exercise the code base in different ways by their usage. That diversity had value just through how they used the code base of something that was open source and built by community. There would be a situation where the functional requirements would be added to because again that diversity created a range of needs to be able to test something. There'd be feedback loops and fora that form because someone's saying, I'm trying it and this is what happened. People would start teaching each other. There would be a skill cross-fertilization. So everywhere I look, because I'm, I now had this sense of saying, I want to, rather than assume the lurker had no purpose, I'm going to start with the assumption the lurker had purpose and then look at the value generated differently. And everywhere I looked, I could see that we were calling these people lurkers, but it's like using junk DNA or dark matter. Human beings have this habit of saying, I don't understand that, so I'm going to give it a, a label and I'm going to park it to one side and everything's going to be okay. And I'm going to improve the quality of the model of the little bit I understand, right? which is insane because a lot of the interest would be in the things you don't understand. So this thing, this group, this 80%, this great unwashed called the lurker, started not just attracting me, but exciting me to say there is a purpose and this purpose is really important. I don't know what that purpose is other than to make what the community builds better because that diversity, that inclusiveness, that ability to test in every single sort of possible use case, the ability to, to tell people what works and what doesn't, improving the iteration cycle, getting those feedback loops really healthy is valuable. And that value is important as long as we define anything we do as community. And I'm starting from the premise, everything we do is community. Life is a team sport. Unfortunately, work hasn't been a team sport uh, because people still get paid individually uh, all companies that I've sort of seen, been in, watched, they talk a big story about collaboration, but that's all it is most of the time because the structures and the processes are about as anti-collaborative as possible. Many of the things we get taught are adversarial in their styling, whether it's in industry or in law and politics or whatever else. We seem to revel in being able to bring adversarial approaches to learning. Uh, rather than truly uh, sort of cooperative, which means that even though our DNA has that, the technology, the environment and context we work in doesn't. I'm now going to end with uh, a mixture between sort of Elon Musk and John Milton. I, uh, as a school kid, I was forced to learn on his blindness, and I was fascinated with the last line, they also serve who only stand and wait. And the sense that he had, you know, that he felt God was giving him a purpose of being able to be patient, to participate just while being patient rather than expect some active contribution from him. And he had to learn how to be peaceful in that patience. Okay, that was part of the, you know, as he became blind in the service of the state, having to work in poor light conditions, he got a sense of peace from it. Uh, yesterday or the day before, someone sent me a clip of Musk and Ma in conversation to do with AI and two very different uh, expectations. And one of the statements made was something like, do you realize that the bandwidth of machines is so much better than the bandwidth of human beings that machines as they evolve faster than humans are going to get to the stage where they get bored with waiting. And a part of me went, aha, you know, I am the child of, of companionable silences, of pregnant pauses, of tempo and timing in human interaction. And no machine is going to be able to solve that that easily. You know, when people ask me about Turing tests kind of thing, my, my favorite example would be 
you know, a, an only fools and horses clip where Trigger and and Rodney are talking, and the the conversation goes something like, "Dave, uh, yes, Trigger, uh, why do they call you Dave? Well, actually, nobody calls me Dave. It's only you who calls me Dave." I said, mm, "All right, Dave." And, and, and that kind, you know, when I can see a computer smile about that, I'll figure something out. But I think that thinking slow, eating slow, living slow, being able to bring time and tempo into our lives is something that differentiates us very much because only someone who really understands interaction and community values the time in that interaction right? uh, and taking that time away as sort of inter-process communication and technology works through only makes you wait faster. Right? There is a, a point at which you can't take that time out. So that's my ending. I think they also serve who only stand and wait. I think we have a lot to learn about this lurker population that we discarded because there is immense value in what the lurker does. I think community is still the answer. I remain a utopian about what technology can do to improve lives. But to do that, we have to redefine what the productive unit size and shape is and what the engagement protocols of society are. And we know them already. It's only a question of being able to bring them back to the fore. Thank you for your time and I'm open for a few questions.